You know what you're listening to? Is that a trick question? It's the I Still Love This Game podcast with your host, Matthew Damien. He's an idiot. Don't listen to this. He's an idiot. Hello and welcome to episode 90 of the I Still Love This Game podcast. The topic for today's show is if Kevin Durant has in fact saved the Golden State Warriors legacy. Now I know that this sounds purposely controversial, but I guarantee you it's not clickbait. So I'm going to have to apply some context here to justify this position. It should also be noted that I hated and still do hate Durant's decision to go to Golden State. So I'm about as far away from a delusional fan that's desperate to change the angle on how he's perceived as possible. Now, onto that all-important context. In 2013, that was the first time the Warriors, with Steph Curry and Klay Thompson, they made the playoffs. And that little number six seed. They upset a 50-win Denver Nuggets team who featured, ironically, Andre Iguodala and Coach of the Year George Carl, who, <laughs> like we just saw with Dwayne Casey last season, he was Coach of the Year and then was fired the very same year he was Coach of the Year. Next up was San Antonio. And the Warriors, they shocked the world in how well they played. I mean, we saw how good they were against Denver, and they won that series. But doing it against Denver is completely different to doing it against uh, the Spurs when they were genuine contenders. And they were unlucky not to get out of Texas with both games uh, as victories, instead of just the 1-1 split. Golden State, of course, went down in six games, but the future looked bright for the Splash Brothers. But an underwhelming 2014 season was capped with a Game 7 loss to the Clippers in a series that was overshadowed by Donald Sterling's phone conversations regarding black people becoming public. In that offseason, the Warriors fired Mark Jackson, who is a guy that was credited for their turnaround, and swooped in on Steve Kerr after it looked like he was a certainty to coach the Knicks and reunite with Phil Jackson. Kerr wanted the team to become younger and didn't waste time in elevating Draymond Green to a starter ahead of David Lee and Harrison Barnes over Iggy. Both these gambles worked, and the Warriors jumped out of the gate quickly. Now, I remember all of this because I was one of the few that caught on early to their potential, and I placed a $50 bet on them when they were paying 26 to 1 odds for the championship, so they made me quite happy at that time. In that season, Golden State won 67 games, Steph Curry was league MVP, and more importantly, No clear contender emerged. San Antonio was in a hangover from winning the title the year prior, and with the loaded West, they were in danger of missing the playoffs entirely. Of course, it should be noted, they finished with the sixth seed, and they battled it out with with the Clippers in the first round, and maybe the best first round series we've ever seen. They also had Kevin Durant, who missed most of the season, and Westbrook only played 60 games himself, and Oklahoma missed the postseason, by one game. And they missed the postseason. They were beat out by the New Orleans Hornets. And if you remember back, uh, New, I think they were the Hornets then. They may have been the Pelicans. I can't remember. But you remember back, that was the, the season where Anthony Davis hit a double clutch three point buzzer beater. Try saying that five times quickly in Oklahoma. And that ended up being the difference between Oklahoma getting in and New Orleans getting in. Now, also in the West, you had the Clippers, who I mentioned earlier, along with the Houston Rockets. Now, both of those teams, whilst looking like championship contenders for many seasons during the regular season, never performed at a high level in the playoffs. So the West was wide open. And with LeBron going back to Cleveland, the, pa- the balance of power in the Eastern Conference shifted from Miami to North East Ohio. Now, if that wasn't bad enough... Every playoff opponent that Golden State faced had serious injury problems, and specifically injury concerns at the point guard position. New Orleans had Drew Holiday missing. And you might be, at the time that wasn't considered major, but we just saw in the, in the last year's playoffs, or last season's playoffs, excuse me, was still in 2018, the impact and the importance of Drew Holiday. Memphis, who were up two games to one on Golden State, before Conley and, and Allen missed games, that was severely hampered in what they could do defensively. Remember Tony Allen, all defensive first team. Remember that game. Who could ever forget that game? When on Steph Curry's MVP award night, 
Tony Allen completely shut him down. <laughs> he was he was valuable. And Mike Conley also, these two had the capabilities of really locking up the Splash Brothers. Houston, who I mentioned a second ago, they somehow escaped the series against the Clippers despite being down three games to one. But they were without star, defensive star, excuse me, Patrick Beverly. And they had to put in Jason Terry, who was 38 years old at the time, to try and defend Curry. Tell me that isn't a mismatch and good fortune for the Warriors. Then in the finals, it wasn't bad enough that the Cleveland was already missing Kevin Love, but Kyrie Irving dislocated his kneecap in Game 1 and was lost for the entire series. Now, I should also say that none of these injuries are the fault of Golden State, and they can only play who is in front of them. But it's impossible to not think that maybe the Warriors in 2015 were transitional champions. A lot of people were saying that. It wasn't just me. And heading into the 2016 season, the Cavs, the Cleveland Cavaliers, with Kyrie, because they were expecting Kyrie Irving to come back, Kevin Love was healthy to start the season as well, they were actually considered the favorites to win the title. Then, of course, the season rolled around, and the Warriors, they won their first 27 games, or 28 games, whatever it was. It was an incredible start to the season. They shattered the NBA record of consecutive wins to begin a season. They looked unbeatable, and they redefined the game before our very eye. These guys were pulling up from 30 feet regularly and blowing out contenders like Cleveland and San Antonio by 40-plus points. It was remarkable. But they were the epitome of the moniker, live by the three, die by the three. And a good example of that is when they would actually lose games, which wasn't very often, but when they would lose games, it would be more often than not by a blowout. And, off, and a lot of times, it'd be by teams you wouldn't expect. Guys that really aren't, or teams that really aren't championship contenders, like uh, the Detroit Pistons or the Minnesota Timberwolves. Honestly, if you slowed down their rhythm from three, you'd have a real good chance of, of winning. But during the regular season, as I said a second ago, that didn't happen too often, as Golden State won 73 games, and they only lost nine. But in the playoffs, they were exposed. Oklahoma City with Durant and Westbrook, they had upset the Spurs in the second round. And then they moved on to building up a three games to one lead on the Warriors by crushing them on the boards and defending the perimeter well. If you did those fundamentals well, you had a real good chance of winning. The Warriors did recover to win game five at home. And in game six, Clay Thompson had the greatest shooting performance in NBA playoff history to extend the series to seven games. Once again, live by the three, die by the three. The Warriors had enough momentum to win game seven, and then themselves would go up three games to one on the this time healthy Cleveland Cavaliers. But then Draymond Green was suspended. And I have little sympathy for him or them as a whole, considering how he escaped suspension in game four of the conference finals, where he kicked Stephen Adams square in the nuts after turning the ball over. But it further confirmed to me how manipulated the league is by inconsistent decisions. Regardless, that's, that's a topic that I have covered many times before and I no doubt will have to cover again. But that's not, the, that's not the purpose of today's show. Game 5, he was suspended in the NBA Finals. And then Iggy's back gets injured. Bogut, who was the only rim protector that they actually had, was injured when J.R. Smith rolled into his knee. LeBron and Kyrie Irving, it, both of them went for 40 points each in Game 5, and the series went back to Cleveland. LeBron put up another 40-point game, but just like in Game 5, the shots weren't following, uh, falling excuse me, for the Warriors shooters. Game 7 is upon us, and despite one of the great games that nobody ever talks about from Draymond Green, the other scorers for the Warriors are choking. Live by the 3, die by the 3, or blow a Game 7 by the 3. After that loss, we get to insert Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant created shockwaves by joining the team that knocked him off the prior season. And I called it the biggest punk move in NBA history. And that's something I completely stand by. The result was 67 wins and the most dominant playoff run in NBA history, 16-1. They backed that up with another championship this past season, despite encountering some serious resistance from Houston along with more luck from the injury gods, with Chris Paul tearing his hamstring at the end of Game 5, just as the Rockets went up three games to win that series. That does not get mentioned enough. The question that has to be asked at this point is what would the Warriors' legacy been had Durant not joined them at that point? 
a team that we cannot deny received some significant assistance from injuries in their first championship. And then they showed how fragile they were in 2016 against, against teams that can rebound well and defend them on the perimeter. How would we remember them? Kevin Durant put them over, to, over the top and took them from being a transitional team with, uh, to maybe one of the best teams of all time. Teams could defend Curry and Thompson because despite Curry being by far the best shooter we've ever seen and Thompson being a borderline top five shooter, they were still inconsistent and susceptible to good defense. With Durant, they added a 27 points per game scorer to that mix. And what's more is that 27 points per game can come in a variety of ways on limited shot attempts. Durant might be the best mid-range scorer in the league today. And while that is not a shot that teams typically look for in today's game, it's required to be a consistent scorer's. Defenders have to respect his range from three. Plus, he gets to the rim and the foul line. But the weapon of his mid-range shooting means that defenders have to stick with him the entire time he's driving. You can't take shortcuts. You can't uh, move two or three back whilst he's dribbling because he'll just pull up, whether it's from 16 feet or 12 feet or 18 feet. It doesn't matter. If you back off him and give him half an inch of daylight because of his length, that's death. That is absolute death. It's a difficult task for anybody that's not an elite defensive player. What it also means is he can start from 20 feet out or 15 feet out in a triple threat. And once again, he's absolutely deadly when he's facing up. This offensive skill set completely complements the shooting for the Warriors and will keep them in games uh, even when the Splash Brothers aren't firing. And if they are hitting their shots, along with Durant, they're a real nightmare to slow down. The chances that any team that is not an elite defensive team of slowing down all three guys, well, they're not good odds. In addition to that, even if a team slows down two of them, any one of those three is capable of carrying that team offensively. We saw that, I mentioned that game in Oklahoma when Clay Thompson put up 46 points and 12 threes on the road facing elimination. That's how capable he is. Earlier this season, we saw him hit how many threes in Chicago. We know what, what he's capable of, and my goodness, we know what Durant and Curry are capable of. Without Durant, though, they didn't have that third dimension on offense. And the fact that they needed this level of offensive firepower does show that this strategy that Golden State has, which is live by the outside shot and die by it, it's still, it really is still flawed. It's just that they have so much talent, offensive talent, that they they can get away with it. The reality in all of this is Durant turned them. He turned the Warriors from a team that was built for the regular season into a team that was built for the postseason. And he doesn't get anywhere near the credit that he deserves for that. You can call him a snake all you like, but at the end of the day, he did save the Warriors' legacy. Without him, we'd probably view the Warriors like we viewed the 04 Pistons. The Pistons took advantage of injuries as well, just like, you know, in the 2004 Finals, with Carl Malone getting hurt, and they made it back to the NBA Finals and then lost in seven games the next season. But that was it. They were done after that. They never made it back to the championship championship series after that. And yes, there were other factors involved, free agent signings, Ben Wallace went to Chicago, things of that nature. But the, re- the fact remains, they never went back to the NBA Finals following 2005. And yes, I, I know, I get it, of course, they did win a ring, but they aren't mentioned as a top-tier NBA team of all time. Now, because of Kevin Durant, the Warriors are considered this. And Durant has obviously also benefited from being in Oakland. I'm not arguing that he hasn't. But this is a mutually beneficial arrangement. The ultimate proof of this is Durant has has been back-to-back finals MVPs. He hasn't been carried. He's the one that has done the bulk of the work, at least offensively. And along with those back-to-back finals MVPs, he has also exposed LeBron's weaknesses in his games. So the next time that you say Durant's rings in in Golden State mean nothing, just ask yourself what the Warriors would look like without him. 2016 really wasn't that long ago, so you don't have to jog your memory back that far. And keep in mind that teams had caught up with them by then. And I'm talking about great teams. I'm not not talking about like the lower echelon teams. I'm talking about the Oklahoma City Thunder, uh, San Antonio to a lesser extent, and of course Cleveland. The reality is... 
And I know this is going against popular opinion, but I really don't care. The reality is, the Warriors needed Durant a hell of a lot more than Durant needed the Warriors. Thanks for listening, guys, and uh, I'll catch you on the next episode.